thought if I could reduce the climate change problem to seven main elements, what would it be? And we have the sort of representatives here tonight. So we have science, represented by Chris, um, and we, we have technology, represented by Jeremy, and we have law, represented tonight by Jake, and then we have economy, represented by uh, Nick, we have culture, represented by Solitaire, we have behaviour, represented by Ro, and we have democracy, represented by Jenny. Climate change is real, it's happening. Um, uh, of course, climate has changed for all sorts of reasons on all sorts of timescales over the long history of the Earth. This time, the primary driver is uh, human activity, the release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and other impacts on, on land use, for example, or, or, or the, the surface of the Earth. It's very interesting to see how the business community is beginning to take this more and more seriously as they feel the impacts on their supply chains, uh, on their uh, future investments, as they look uh, into the future, trying to decide where it's safe and where not uh, safe to invest. Um, and that there are things that we can do about it, although um, there is this uh, lacuna in that what is being done is minuscule compared with what the science says needs to be done. And the bottom line of the science is that there is a limited amount of fossil fuel left that we can burn. Uh, and the issue for society, society informed by that science is how to uh, decarbonise the world economy and not burn beyond that limit. And we can argue exactly what that limit is, but uh, the, the principle is there. And the final thing I would say is that the science will always have irreducible uncertainties, but that doesn't mean that one shouldn't act. There are three megatrends emerging in the modern world that should uh, offer us hope. The first is that the incumbents, the people who are fueling climate change are very much on a frontier. Because they're on a frontier, their costs are going up, are soaring. The second trend is that the cost of the survival technologies, the clean energy technologies, particularly solar and storage, are going down spectacularly fast. Germany's biggest utility, E.ON, just before Christmas, announced it was doing a 180 degree turn on its business model. It's parking all the incumbency technologies, fossil fuels and nuclear. All the growth is going to be focused on renewables and energy efficiency and clean, smart, new 21st century stuff. And I emphasize this is Germany's biggest utility. The third thing, of course, is climate policy, because the biggest emitters get it. The Obama White House gets it, wants it to be a legacy issue, has struck a deal with China, who definitely get it, because their politicians tend to be engineers, and they understand that their economy is on the coastal plain, and they are going to lose their coastal plain on current trajectory. So the Americans, the Chinese have struck a deal that could be the heart of a rapprochement in Paris. We can live in hopes. These three things all come together, and we should do everything we can to maximise their impact on society and the world in the direction we want to go. This is an enormous opportunity. If you look back at past industrial revolutions, technological change, you can have radical change and innovation and investment and growth. Actually, they come together. This is a real opportunity. It's a growth story. The sustainable growth story is the growth story of the future. So what you've got is a world that's fundamentally changing You've got three and a half billion people in cities now. It will be six and a half billion by 2050. How we manage those cities, an enormous opportunity to make it cleaner, quieter, safer. You've got technical change at a more rapid pace than it's ever been in human history, in digital, in materials and in bio and so on. Uh, you've got this moment where we have to reduce climate change because delay is extremely dangerous and you've got interest rates on the floor. If that isn't an opportunity, I don't know what is. It is such a big issue that people don't want to believe it. I think part of that is um, it's too terrifying, it's too big, it, um, it suggests that the way things are going um, can't continue and nobody wants to, to contemplate that. And also, of course, there are vested interests. People, they have their pension funds locked up in fossil fuels and, and the, the, they don't want to have to do the enormous amount of work to find other ways of, of making money. I was talking to somebody today, a conservative woman, who started telling me about Pakistan and how there's 180 million people in Pakistan who need energy, and they have the fourth largest coal seam or coal field under Pakistan, and so they have to use that. And I was saying, but surely Pakistan's got quite a lot of sun, and um, wouldn't it be better to actually make every single house a little mini power station? And she was saying, yes, yes, but 180 million people, that's it's just too many. Please raise your hands if you're scared, afraid, fear, 
climate change and the impacts it's going to have. Who in here is afraid? For those watching at home or listening at home, that's about 80%, 90%. That's, yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that you probably don't get asked as often, which is who here believes that we're going to make it? Mm, okay. That's about a third, I think. About a third. And this is essentially what, for me, the, cu the cultural conversation is. It's about the semiotics, the symbols, the languages, and the very deep beliefs that we have around culture change. Because if culturally, if in our dynamic, in our conversations, both on the news, in politics, in The Simpsons, in The Daily Show, if there is a cultural belief that we're going to lose this fight, then macro psychology would suggest that we will. Whereas if there's a cultural belief that we will win this fight, then macro psychology suggests that that becomes more likely, or at least possible. But reflecting on words such as developed versus developing country. Bloody awful is that? We live in a developed country, an end state. When it comes to climate change, of course, we are a developing country. And how much more exciting is that? So part of my hope around the conversation around culture is that we can bring back the idea of progress. My question is, why aren't the politicians legislating that the companies who have made so much money out of the oil industry, that they should be investing some of that huge money into undoing the damage they have done by accelerating a move to renewables? Starting with the law, yes, you're absolutely right. The polluter pays principle is a fundamental principle of EU law, certainly. Um, and it finds its way into UK law, mainly uh, from that particular source. And I think it is it can be enormously sort of constructive and a sort of generative kind of principle that we can apply. Um, that said, I think what you're suggesting is, is potentially difficult. Um, I think it's potentially probably more politically difficult than it is legally difficult. I know that in legal terms, people are looking at the possibility of, of using recourse to the courts to explore precisely this kind of angle. So what you would do is you would go to the court and you would say, you know, BP's historical responsibility for a rather significant proportion of carbon emissions over the course of the last 80, 90 years has led to this particular impact on this particular island state over here. For obvious reasons, that's tremendously difficult to do because you've got to prove that to the satisfaction of the court. I'd like to ask how can members of the public be convinced to make small changes in their behaviour when at a national level questionable practices in carbon trading and futures make their actions irrelevant? I think that there is, in a way... We ask individuals to make small changes, and that echoes the fact that we seem to also only expect governments to make small yeah. changes and businesses to make small changes. A lot of the work that I do is in, actually is encouraging people to see that they can make big changes yeah. in their personal lives that, that we can mostly, most of us can actually sure. look quite realistically at halving our current carbon footprints. There's a lot of joy in that mm. because there's a lot of collective activity in it and you start to produce some of the kind of cultural changes where you find yourself living amongst other people who are thinking the same way and are planning on doing the same kinds of things, are enthusiastic about it, are getting politically engaged as well as personally engaged. So I think we need to move away from the idea of individuals only taking small okay. steps. I think we want them to kind of take huge jumps and run okay. miles. Miriam McCarthy's not here, but she had a great question which connects with the general election coming up. It's basically, how can we encourage political backing and appropriate policy and funding support to ca tackle climate change in spite of short-term competing political priorities? There's one huge drama that could really resonate and connect with everything that we've talked about so far in the election, and that is the shale narrative here in the, in the UK. We have a government um, that is kind of half or two-thirds hooked on it, and they're pushing this narrative to ludicrous levels. David Cameron was in Davos saying that he's going to frack his way to cheap gas on such a scale that manufacturing industry will be brought back to Britain. Now, this is lunacy, and uh, the, it, easy to prove as such, because right now the shale narrative is coming off the rails in the United States in a slow-motion tr train crash. So if this becomes realized and socialized and the government is forced to do a 180 degree U-turn and it's the currency of the election, the question will be, where do we go next? Okay. And the answer to that is going to be the right answer.